Okay, everybody, welcome. Uh, my name is Stephen Collis. I'm the faculty director of the Beck Lachlan First Amendment Center. Uh, my primary role today is to welcome you and then get out of the way. I also want to welcome everyone who's joining us online. I know we have a mixed audience of in-person and online. Um, I am going to hand it over to Meg McDonough, who is a research assistant in the Beck Lachlan First Amendment Center, and she's going to be our, um, our moderator today. Meg is a 1L uh, in the First Amendment Center and doing, and doing great work for us. So Meg, please uh, take it away. I'll let you introduce all of our speakers and kind of run the show. All right, um, so I should turn my mic on, please. Is that better? Yeah, okay. So first we'll hear from Judge Bumate. Judge Bumate was confirmed as a circuit judge on the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in December of 2019. He previously served as an assistant U.S. attorney in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of California, where he was a member of the Appellate and Narcotics Section. He was also a counselor to the Attorney General on various criminal issues, including on national opioid strategy and combating transnational organized crime. Judge Bumate has also worked in other positions in the Department of Justice, including the Office of the Deputy Attorney General, the Office of the Associate Attorney General, where he was responsible for overseeing various aspects of the department's civil enforcement program in the Office of Legal Policy. Upon graduation from law school, Judge Bumate served as a law clerk to Judge Timkovich, one of our other panelists today. Next, we will hear from Judge Ho. Judge Ho is a circuit judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Before his appointment in January of 2018, he was co-chair of the National Appellate and Constitutional Law Practice Group of Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher. As an appellate litigator for over a decade, Judge Ho was routinely ranked among leading advocates nationwide by Benchmark, Chambers USA, Law 360, The Legal 500, The National Law Journal, and other publications. His decade as an appellate lawyer also included three years of service as the Solicitor General of Texas. He won three Supreme Court Best Brief Awards from the National Association of Attorneys General, and he is the only state Solicitor General in history to be invited by the U.S. Supreme Court to express the views of the state. Judge Ho previously served in all three branches of the federal government. On the Senate Judiciary Committee, he served as chief counsel of the subcommittees on the Constitution and Immigration under Senator John Cornyn. At the Justice Department, he served as a special assistant to the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights and an attorney advisor at the Office of Legal Counsel. He clerked for Judge Smith of the Fifth Circuit and Justice Clarence Thomas of the US Supreme Court. He's also served, or currently serves, as an adjunct professor here at UT. And lastly, we will hear from Judge Timkovich. Judge Timkovich is the chief judge of the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. He joined the bench in 2003, and in 2015, he became chief circuit judge. He was chair of the US Judicial Conference, Conferences Committee on Judicial Resources from 2011 to 2015. Prior to joining the court, he worked in private practice for over a decade and served as the Solicitor General of Colorado, arguing several cases in front of the Supreme Court. <coughs> Since 2008, he's been an adjunct professor of law at the University of Colorado School of Law, teaching election law. He is a member of the Doyle Inn of Court, the American Law Institute, and the International Society of Barristers. Since he joined the circuit, Judge Tim Kmitz has hosted judicial delegations from Russia, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, and has also represented the United States in programs at Kyiv and Yalta in Ukraine. So each judge will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, and after that, we will open up the floor for Q&A. Judge Bumate. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Meg. I appreciate that. And I have to say, it's a real treat to be uh, on this panel with these uh, great judges. You know, as, as Meg mentioned, Judge Timkovich, I clerked for you back in 2006, and you've been a friend and mentor for over 16 years, which I'm grateful for. And Everything I've learned about judging, I've learned from you. So it is a real honor to appear on stage with you uh, for the first time ever. So. It's a good, good export to the Ninth Circuit. Yes, then. exactly. Well, thank you. <laughs> and Judge Ho, we've been friends since we were young attorneys in the Bush administration. And it's uh, been fun to watch your accomplishments uh, through the years. So great to be here with you. So I want to start things off by discussing the intersection of COVID-19 uh, with the First Amendment. It's often said that our laws and legal norms are most tested during times of crisis. And I think that the COVID-19 crisis has proven that. I wanna discuss this topic in the context of Tandon v. Newsom, 
a Ninth Circuit case I worked on, uh, which incidentally came out one year ago today. Uh, in that case, I think the Supreme Court first laid out a comprehensive framework for considering First Amendment uh, cases during the pandemic. And it goes without saying that the COVID-19 uh, virus has upended our country. It was a little more than two years ago that we all faced the trauma and uncertainty of closing down our schools, our businesses, and our communities uh, to combat the, the spread of COVID-19. And it's taken a terrible toll on our country. According to some reports, over 900,000 Americans have died from the virus. And so I start with the premise that governments rightfully believe that they needed to act. Our, under our constitutional system, it's the states and the executive branch that have, are their tasks with safeguarding the health and safety of our people. That generally means that courts should, should not needlessly meddle in the government's response to the COVID. And I think I can safely speak for the judges on this panel that none of us as judges are competent to direct the government's response to COVID-19. But, and this is a huge but, that, mean, that doesn't mean that courts can turn a blind eye to every governmental action. The Constitution is an enduring guarantee, and the rights it enshrines must always be safeguarded, even in times of crisis. And as judges, you must never abdicate our role as the defenders of the Constitution. And as you have no doubt learned by now, the free exercise, or clause, uh, free exercise of religion clause as guaranteed by the First Amendment is among our most fundamental freedoms. To me, that means religious exercise must be treated like any other basic necessity just like food, water, clothing, and shelter. And states can't infringe on that right to that basic necessity without being subject to strict scrutiny. It is within this backdrop that the Ninth Circuit confronted California's COVID-19 response plan in tandem versus Newsom. California had instituted a household gatherings restrictions for the state. For example, California banned all indoor and outdoor gatherings at home with more than three households but commercial businesses were subject to a different restriction. Personal care businesses, for example, could remain open without any maximum household restriction. So then that meant that you couldn't have more than two other families in your house, but hair salons, barbershops, tattoo parlors could have an unrestricted number of strangers gather in their businesses. The plaintiffs in tandem were a pastor and a religious couple who wanted to continue hosting Bible studies in their homes. Under California's rules, that could not happen. And keep in mind that this is a year into the pandemic crisis, so we were not operating on a blank slate. The Supreme Court had struck down COVID restrictions on First Amendment grounds numerous times. In fact, by then, the Supreme Court had reversed four Ninth Circuit opinions because we had failed to respect the fundamental nature of the first uh, free exercise right. Reading those decisions, I think the Supreme Court left us with three important principles. First, COVID regulations must place a religious activity on an equal footing with the most favored class of comparable secular activities. So states can't satisfy the, can, uh, the Constitution by equally disfavoring, disfavoring religion and some other secular activities. In other words, if a state wants to give a comparable secular activity any advantage, I think the Constitution requires that the religious activity be given the same treatment. Second, a, re a re regulation doesn't survive just because it doesn't expressly call out religion. In Tandon, California had learned from its prior missteps where it had expressly put religious activity in its own category and, give it, and given it disfavored status. Under the revised plan that we faced in the, this case, religious activity was not expressly singled out but so long as religious activity was disfavored in any way, I, I thought it did not matter as far as the Constitution was concerned. Third, we can compare a state's treatment of businesses to its treatment of religious practice. Some of my colleagues agree that the Supreme Court has said that states cannot uh, discriminate against houses of worship, but they argue that we shouldn't compare other forms of religious exercise to the tre treatment of commercial enterprises. But I think the Constitution protects religious activities in all forms. So I don't believe there's any reason why courts should shy away from asking whether a business activity is comparable to a religious one, whether or not it's in a church or elsewhere. Under this framework, I thought that California's restriction easily uh, violated the First Amendment. Under California's rules, the plaintiffs could not continue to hold a Bible study with more than two households in their house or backyard, yet California allowed tattoo parlors 
to continue to inject ink into the arms, legs, and faces of their clients with no household limitation. That made no sense, considering that both activities could occur in, the, in, in an indoor space of the same size. As I said, California is free to adopt narrowly tailored measures to protect against COVID transmission during, for, uh, uh, dr for during religious gatherings, but one thing California could not do is privilege tattoo parlors over Bible studies when it comes to giving exemptions. So unfortunately, um, my view uh, was in dissent and two of my colleagues disagreed with me, so I, my, my view is relegated to a dissent. But a little more than two weeks later, the Supreme Court reversed the Ninth Circuit, largely adopting the rationale employed in my dissent. First, the Supreme Court said that government relations are not neutral and generally applicable and therefore trigger strict scrutiny whenever they treat any comparable secular activity more favorable than religious activity. Second, we judge the comparability of two, of the, two activities against the state's asserted interests that justifies the regulation at interest. Thus, businesses and at-home worship are valid comparators because they both test and implicate the state's interest in combating the, COVID, uh, the spread of COVID. Third, where the government permits other activities to proceed with precautions, the government must show why the religious activity is more dangerous or why the same precaution can't be applied to the religious activity. The court expressed almost exasperation at the Ninth Circuit's inability to properly respect the First Amendment right during COVID. It said, quote, this is the fifth time the court has summarily rejected the Ninth Circuit's analysis of California's COVID restriction on religious activities. As I like to say, a broken clock is right twice a day, but it takes some effort to get it wrong as many times as the Ninth Circuit has <laughs> on religious liberty cases. And unfortunately, I wish I could report that we've learned our lesson, but that's just not the case. Just earlier this year, the Ninth Circuit affirmed the San Diego School District's vaccine mandate without any religious exemptions, even though permitted a host of secular exemptions. The district provided medical exemptions, age exemptions, exemptions for students in remedial programs, exemptions for students who had recently moved into the district. In total, 85% of the students uh, were subject to a, an exemption uh, uh, to the vaccine mandate, but yet uh, the school district didn't provide one for religious observers. To me, this again was an obvious violation of the First Amendment. The only reason the Supreme Court did not strike us down yet a sixth time was because a state court enjoined the vaccine mandate on state law grounds. So the bottom line for me is this. The Constitution means what it says about the free exercise of religion. It is a fundamental right, and judges must stay vigilant in preserving that right even when we are facing unprecedented challenges. Thank you. My turn? All right. <clears throat> well, first of all, I want to uh, echo Judge Bumate's uh, introductory comments. I'm deeply honored to be here at the UT Center on, on the First Amendment, uh, wonderful hospitality and, and, and camaraderie. Uh, and I'm, I'm humbled to be on this panel with two of the most uh, distinguished members of the federal judiciary. Uh, Judge Timkovich has obviously been uh, one of the great leaders of our federal system uh, for some time now. Uh, Judge Bumte, you're, you're younger and, new, and newer, uh, 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 but, but already uh, establishing some, some remarkable leadership uh, on, on your court uh, out in the Ninth Circuit. Uh, Judge Bumate has just explored some of the cutting edge, uh, hotly disputed, ongoing First Amendment controversies uh, that have emerged in this uh, tragic COVID-19 era. Uh, my discussion today is going to be following on sort of the opposite end of that spectrum, of the spectrum. And what I mean by that is I'm gonna talk about two cases that involve sort of more traditional bread and butter areas of First Amendment uh, protection that I've uh, had to deal with as a judge. Uh, and that's the right of every American citizen to ask questions of public officials and to hold political beliefs and to exercise these rights, of course, without fear of being punished uh, in any way, shape or form by, by the government. Now, you might think, well, this discussion should be pretty boring and uncontroversial then, because uh, these are obviously rights that every American citizen surely has. But if you're familiar with the doctrine of qualified immunity, then, you're, then you'll see, I think, why these cases I'm going to talk about 
end up being controversies where federal judges did disagree. Uh, and that's because if you're seeking money damages uh, against a public official under a statute like uh, Section 1983, then it's actually not enough as a plaintiff to simply demonstrate a constitutional violation. Uh, you also, as a plaintiff, have to prove that the violation was obvious or clearly established. And, and that's where you start to see judges dividing uh, over whether the First Amendment violation is so obvious, so well established, that the officials should not be entitled to the presumption uh, in our law of qualified immunity. So I, I'm going to talk about two cases. The first is a case called Villarreal versus City of Laredo. And the case is still pending. Uh, there's an opinion out that, that I've authored. So I'm going to sort of just limit myself to what's in the public record. Uh, Priscilla Villarreal is a citizen journalist uh, from Laredo, Texas. Uh, and by, by that term, I mean that on the one hand, she regularly reports on local crime, missing persons, community events, traffic, uh, and local government issues. But on the other hand, uh, instead of publishing her stories in a traditional journalistic outlet, like a newspaper, uh, she posts them on her Facebook page. Uh, instead of using a tape recorder uh, to conduct interviews, she uses her cell phone to live stream video footage of, for example, crime, crime scenes and traffic accidents. Uh, her reporting, uh, appropriate to a citizen journalist, uh, often includes some very colorful and unfiltered commentary. Uh, she apparently calls herself La Gortoloca. I apologize, I'm sure I'm butchering that. La Gortoloca, which I understand roughly translates to, her words, not mine, crazy fat lady. <laughs> She's been profiled by the New York Times as one of Laredo's most popular news sources with over 120,000 Facebook followers. Uh, and in particular, uh, her reputation uh, precedes her because she is especially not shy about criticizing law enforcement. She frequently reports on incidents of uh, and allegations of police misconduct and abuse of power in both the Laredo Police Department and the Laredo District Attorney's Office. And as you might imagine, Laredo officials have time and time made clear to her that they are less than enthused with the reporting. And that, of course, is what leads us to the two events that triggered this very case. The first is when she published a story about a man who committed suicide. Her story identified the man by name and revealed uh, that he was an agent of the US War Patrol. And she got this name uh, through one source, but then confirmed it by asking a police officer uh, to confirm the identity. And there was a second incident where uh, a the a family was involved in a fatal car accident. She again got the name uh, from one source, but confirmed it by asking a police officer to confirm it. Uh, six months later, two arrest warrants were issued for Villarreal for violating an obscure provision of the Texas Penal Code that by all accounts, Laredo officials had never used before. It, it makes it illegal to solicit or receive non-public information from a public servant with the intent to obtain an economic advantage. So you can imagine, you know, if, if you get special non-public information from the AG's office about a pending investigation of a big company, and then use that information to sell the company's stock short, that's what the statute's talking about. But that's obviously not what's going on here. She's not. Uh, intending to obtain economic advantage, uh, but, but instead to be a good journalist. Uh, and that's all, that's all she thought. Um, so it's hard to say that, that there was any authority for this kind of action, and certainly with respect to the Texas Penal Code. But as I noted, the problem here is the qualified immunity doctrine, uh, the, because the plaintiff has to prove not just the violation, but a clearly established one. So in my majority opinion, I concluded that uh, the district court got it wrong. Uh, and that this was such an obvious violation of the First Amendment that you actually don't need to cite a case. And there's a s small series of Supreme Court cases that say you actually don't need to actually cite a case. Uh, normally you do. In the vast majority of cases, you have to have a specific precedent. But if the case is so obviously egregiously unconstitutional, then you can just essentially cite the Constitution. And so I used uh, a series of analogies uh, because there are cases, for example, that say you have a First Amendment right to curse at a public official, and so I re reasoned, if you have the right to curse at an official, surely you have the right to politely ask a question. If you have the right to uh, publish information that you got from the government, as you surely, to, as you surely do, uh, then you should likewise have the right to ask the government for that very same information in the first place. 
Um, and, and finally, if the, federal, if the First Amendment expressly safeguards your right to petition the government for a redress of grievances, which is obviously the express text of the First Amendment, then surely you've also got the right to petition the government for information. So that's the Villarreal case. The second case I'll talk about is one called uh, Arnor, Oliver versus Arnold. Uh, it's well established that students in public schools are not required to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, that's the, the landmark case called West Virginia versus Barnett, which uh, stands not just for the narrow proposition that you can't be forced to recite the Pledge of Allegiance, it stands for the broader proposition that you really can't be forced to endorse any political viewpoint that you don't wish to agree with. Now, obviously, on the other hand, it goes without saying that teachers can obviously teach and teachers can obviously uh, test. It would be weird if I said otherwise at the University of Texas Law <laughs> School. Um, uh, the whole point of a test, of course, is to, to force students to speak uh, in order to show off what you know. Uh, but what teachers cannot do, and what Barnett uh, quite, quite clearly establishes, is that you can't force students to endorse a political viewpoint. Uh, and yet that's actually what would happen in this case. A high school sociology teacher uh, required his students to transcribe the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, this is a, a sociology class for seniors. Uh, Arnold says that he gave this assignment to, quote, teach students that people sometimes recite things every day out of habit, out of rote, without ever really thinking about what these words mean. So his pedagogical purpose was, I want you to know what the pledge is all about. Just, don't just cite it uh, automatically. One of his students, uh, Ms. Mary Oliver, didn't want to participate in this because she has personal objections to the pledge, both on racial grounds as a young black woman, uh, quote, she feels that the uh, the portion declaring America to be a nation under God fails to recognize many religions, doesn't match her religious beliefs, and uh, a country that does not, in fact, provide freedom and justice for all based on race. Whether or not one agrees or, or disagrees with those sentiments, these are obviously political and religious viewpoints that Oliver is constitutionally entitled to hold, and, and to do so without being sanctioned by a government agent, including a public school teacher. Again, there was no uh, plausible pedagogical purpose, the one that he stated she fully met. She clearly knows what the pledge is. That's the whole point of her objection. Um, so, uh, so she appeared, by all accounts, to satisfy uh, what the teacher claims he wanted. Yet the teacher nevertheless scolded her publicly, very harshly in front of the entire class, and gave her a zero grade. Uh, because there was no apparent pedagogical purpose served here, a uh, majority of the court uh, agreed uh, that she was entitled to proceed to trial uh, on her claim of, of, of a Barnett violation, notwithstanding the doctrine of qualified immunity. Uh, and I learned actually just, just yesterday, uh, according to press accounts, that the case has apparently uh, been settled uh, for a $90,000 uh, award. Meanwhile, as I said, uh, Ms. Villarreal, uh, the crazy fat lady's case, <laughs> Uh, her case remains pending, um, so we'll see what happens there. Uh, but to sum up, it, it may, be, may seem obvious that the First Amendment, I hope it seems obvious, that the First Amendment protects basic rights, like the right of every American to ask public officials questions, uh, and the right of every American citizen uh, to hold political beliefs, no matter what they are, no matter how unpopular or extreme or upsetting they may be to a fellow American citizen. Hopefully these are obvious, but as these two cases demonstrate, there is still work to be done uh, to make sure that these, the rights uh, that we assume are in the Constitution are in fact guaranteed, not just in theory, uh, but in reality as well. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, it's great to be at the University of Texas, and um, I echo the sentiments of my two colleagues. Um, it is especially an honor to um, be at the first event where I'm able to sit with um, Judge Bumate as my former clerk, and a chance to do a forum like this is really exciting for me. And it's even more special because it was organized by Professor Collis, um, who, who clerked for me in 2010, um, before, and he was a partner in a Denver law firm before he was able to come to the University of Texas and establish the center. So I'm not just one 
former clerk, but two former clerks today. And it's really exciting for me to be a part um, of this program. And you know, the subject matter um, also is, um, couldn't be more contemporary. Uh, I looked at a couple of cases I could do, and um, um, I picked, I, I had two on my list. I don't think we have time for two cases. Um, um, both of them went to the Supreme Court. Um, in one of the cases, I won, um, and it was affirmed. And the other case, I lost, and I was reversed. And so I'm trying to decide which case to select. I'm going to pick the one that I won. <laughs> uh, and, and, I, and I, I, I should, you know, I, I think one global observation I'd like to start with is that um, since John Roberts um, became the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, you can really see a trajectory of First Amendment jurisprudence that's very noticeable in a number of areas of the law. And uh, I teach election law uh, at the University of Colorado Law School, and it's probably most remarkable there um, since um, Justice Roberts and then Justice Alito came on the U.S. Supreme Court, the um, application of the First Amendment to um, cam campaign finance and other election issues has been really transformational. And I think that's true in other areas involving um, uh, funerals and fighting words and videos. And I think you're going to see a continuing, um, you know, very close attention to the First Amendment rights, as Judge Bumate mentioned, in the areas of, of uh, vaccines and and um, COVID restrictions, you've, you've already seen that. The case I'm gonna talk about is one that, that um, most of you might, re might recall, it's called um, Hobby Lobby versus Sebelius. Um, and it started in the, in the uh, Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals um, shortly after the um, Congress passed the Affordable Care Act in 2009. Uh, as, a part of, as a part of the act, um, uh, a, a task force was established that recommended that um, employers uh, around in, uh, uh, and private corporations be required to provide a contraception um, uh, coverage for its em for employees um, over a certain threshold of of uh, n numbers of, of employees and the like. And so, after several years, the uh, so-called contra contraception mandate uh, was established. And um, when it was finally promulgated by regulation in 2012, um, it created a number of cases among uh, religiously minded employers. Now there was an exception in the um, provision for um, churches and kind of traditional um, religious organizations, um, but it was a relatively narrow exception and didn't apply um, very broadly at all. In Oklahoma, uh, there was um, a company called Hobby Lobby, uh, founded by Barb and Stephen Green um, 25, 30 years ago and had grown to a national business with over 500 uh, franchises around the country. I'm sure there's a lot, of, lot here in, in Austin, Texas, um, as there was in Denver. Um, they, they filed a lawsuit in the District Court of Oklahoma along with um, one of their sons, Stephen Green, who um, founded a company called Mardell. And Mardell was a series of um, Christian book, bookstores. And uh, uh, although it was a for-profit private corporation, as was Hobby Lobby. Um, across the circuit um, from Oklahoma into Colorado, there was a, a company um, also uh, that had uh, uh, similar views. It was um, a small construction company. Its founders were um, devout Catholic believers, uh, and they objected. And although they were you know, an employer of maybe 20 or 30 people, they objected to the contraception mandate. Um, both of these companies sued in district court um, seeking relief under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act from the provisions of the, of the um, contra contraception mandate. In Denver, um, a district court judge ruled in favor of the construction company and enjoined the application of the, of the, the mandate to that business. Um, on the other hand, in Oklahoma City, the district court uh, rejected the arguments of the, um, of the uh, uh, Hobby Lobby and the Christian bookstore and um, fit, refused to grant a preliminary injunction or a stay. Um, that created um, two cases that came out the different way in the, in the Tenth Circuit. Um, both companies had appealed. Uh, the, government, the government had appealed the um, contractor case and the um, Hobby Lobby um, and Mardell had, had appealed their, court, uh, their case. Given the intra-circuit um, split, 
uh, my court decided to have what's called an initial en banc, uh, something that rarely happens, um, uh, but this was one case where it seemed appropriate and the majority of our court felt that it was the best, um, best approach. Um, first, we had the split of, uh, you know, on a very fundamental and controversial issue. Um, second, if Hobby Lobby lost, the fines and penalties that they would face um, ranged from $27 million to, believe it or not, $475 million in potential annual fines because of the uh, per employee penalty. So there's a substantial financial injury at stake. And uh, so my court took the, took the case. Um, we had an oral argument in April and an opinion got out in June. So it was a really fast track case. And um, around the country, almost every circuit had um, one of these contraception mandate cases pending um, by, the time we, um, by, by the time that we heard our case. Um, although we were one of the first cases to um, issue a ruling on the mandate, and we were the first court to find in favor of the, um, of the, uh, of the private employers. Um, so just b big picture, and I won't take long because I know there will be questions. The Re Religious Freedom Restoration Act was uh, enacted in the, um, in the 1990s. It came on the heels of a case called Employment Division versus Smith, and it was an effort by um, Congress to apply um, stricter religious protections to um, individuals than um, existed after the, um, after the decision in Smith. Um, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA, believe it or not, was sponsored by Orrin Hatch and Ted Kennedy in the Senate. It passed the House of Representatives unanimously and signed by Bill Clinton into law. Um, that's only 20 years ago, but can, if you can imagine the politics of RIFRA now, it would be probably diametrically uh, opposite. So a, you know, a broadly popular um, and uh, strongly protective uh, statute on the book. Some call it a super statute because it, it uh, applies across the uh, federal government um, in, in many ways. Um, so RIFRA, it, um, it protects the free exercise of religion by persons um, unless the government can show a compelling interest that's narrowly tailored to the circumstances. So a traditional strict scrutiny type of analysis. Um, in my court, the primary battle line was whether Hobby Lobby and Mardell, the Christian bookstore, were eligible for protection under RIFRA um, because they were a person or not. And um, uh, it, it may sound like a simple um, question to you because corporations are persons for many aspects of the law, but there was a really strongly um, presented and difficult legal issue, and um, no court at the time had really applied the RIFRA protections to um, a private corporation. And the district court below said, no, there's no protection for corporations because they don't, they don't pray, you know, go to church, et cetera, you know, they're, they're disembodied companies. Um, my court um, disagreed in a five to three decision that I authored. Um, we concluded that uh, persons had traditionally been included um, associations of people, partnerships, corporations, nonprofit corporations, and the like. And there's no reason to think that Congress intended otherwise. In RIFRA, um, other statutes like Title VII, the Congress knows how to craft an exemption um, uh, or define person differently uh, when they want to. So my court concluded that a for-profit corporation was eligible for protections under RIFRA. Then we turned to the um, compelling interests and the narrowly tailored part and concluded that um, although uh, my, my court concluded that there were, there were no compelling interests um, at this level because the government um, asserted such a broad kind of public safety, um, gender equality interest that, that um, uh, a majority of my court um, did not um, credit, credit that argument. And then we found that the, that the um, contraception mandate was not narrowly tailored um, because it granted numerous other exemptions, something like 50% of the employers in the country were eligible for an exemption. You know, given, given that type of uh, lack of coverage, um, it's hard to credit the compelling interest that was being served um, that way. And secondly, um, we concluded that the federal government could um, directly fund uh, con the certain contraception um, methods that were being objected by the uh, plaintiffs. They could provide direct funding for those. Um, and so, you know, so we ruled in favor of Hobby Lobby. Within a few weeks, every, um, Four or five other circuits decided similar cases. There was a circuit split with the Third Circuit shortly after um, my decision. It went up to the U.S. Supreme Court, 
and, um, uh, and was argued and, and, and decided later in, in uh, 2013. Justice Alito um, wrote the majority opinion. Um, uh, there was a dissent by Justice um, Ginsburg. I'd like to say that Justice Alito more or less did a cut and paste from, the, from, from my opinion, uh, maybe like Judge Bumate's as well. Um, but uh, he, the, the majority of the court agreed with, with our analysis on the um, personhood of corporations. Um, you know, classic examples include the small co kosher uh, butcher or, or grocery store. Um, it's hard that ha you had objections to certain restrictions on slaughtering or staying, staying open on on uh, Saturdays and the like. Um, and I, I think that um, you know, some of that um, type of analogy really resonated with the court. Um, although there was a d uh, dissent by Justice Ginsburg, um, Justice Kagan and Ju Justice Breyer did not join the um, argument that, per that a person could never include a, um, a uh, religious employer even just because it's a for-profit uh, corporations. And then just to finish up, the, the primary argument of the dissent, um, in addition to kind of the statutory interpretation, was a policy argument. And that is, um, we are going to open the floodgates um, to um, insincere um, al allegations of religious uh, belief in order to evade um, these ge general statutes that apply to everybody. So a classic slippery slope argument. And I, I think there might have been some force to that at the time. I think people worried about it. Um, but really, since the Hobby Lobby decision, um, no, no floodgates were released. You don't see um, you know, overbroad applications of religious objections to um, these types of laws. Um, in fact, you, you, um, you see a very narrow approach in, in uh, Judge Bumate's case where you have a, a religious um, entity seek, seeking an, an exemption in just the type of framework that, uh, that the RIFRA um, opinions lay out. Um, so I think the um, slippery slope argument has been answered in the negative, um, which I think it, it should and would have been. And I think the, it's an example of how the federal courts can continue to um, p police the intersection between um, public policy and religious free exercise. Thank you. Thank you, judges. And so now we're going to open up the floor for Q&A and feel free to ask about other questions in other areas of law or about clerking or anything like that. Don't be shy. Up in the front. Judge B, you go first. <laughs> and can, can I just emphasize, for people watching online and for video, can you repeat the question? Because I don't think his voice will get picked up. Uh, so whoever answers it can. Okay. So can. The, as I understand the question is, uh, is there tensions between the uh, free exercise clause and establishment clause? And how do we see things going? I don't know if I have much to say on that. The, the only uh, case that I've had been on record of, of, of late is there's a case before the Supreme Court right now. It's called uh, Bremerton versus um, uh, Seattle, I'm sorry? Kennedy. Kennedy. I'm oh, sorry, yes. Bremerton, uh, Kennedy versus Bremerton. No. And the case involves whether uh, a, a, a high school coach would kneel on the center field line after, after every football game and, and give a silent prayer. So uh, my court had held that that, uh, number one, violated the Establishment Clause um, and didn't violate the Free Exercise Clause. So that, there's a direct tension there. I signed on a, a dissent that said that, um, that no, that the, the uh, free exercise, uh, the, 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 the coach's free right to, to pray silently after the game uh, is, predominates and that, that, that right should have been respected. But there is obviously um, some tensions there. I was actually going to say the same thing. <clears throat> I have not had a case as a judge uh, involving that tension. I certainly remember studying it in law school and finding it fascinating. And then fast forward to many years later, that uh, Coach Kennedy case was actually one that was uh, handled at the time uh, by, uh, by the law firm that I was at uh, b before I, I and my colleagues left, left the firm for various reasons. So, uh, uh, but I remember that case vividly and we'll, we'll see what the Supreme Court says. Uh, 
Oh, interesting. So the question is, I, uh, is that will the strict scrutiny change as they are applied to contexts like the military and prisons? Um, I don't think so. I mean, my, my view, strict scrutiny should mean one thing. I, I, I've written about this, how you know, the tiers of scrutiny are so malleable by, uh, uh, courts have interpreted the tiers of scrutiny so malleably that they can mean anything you want. And if, if they should mean anything, they should be that they should be consistently applied through all contexts so that all parties and courts know how to apply them. So um, I've not seen that yet, but I, I hope not. And we, we did see that we were talking at dinner last night about the Holt case, um, which involves um, a, a prison setting where um, a Muslim prisoner wanted to have facial hair and there was a rule against that. And the, you know, the prison made an argument of, you know, of institutional safety um, and the, the Supreme Court was able to you know, reject that defense by the government and ruled in favor of the pr prisoner. Was that, una was that a unanimous decision? Hold, yeah, nine, 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 yeah. So, um, you, you have seen that in some, some institutional settings, uh, and um, uh, but but I think um, you know one thing it, it creates, and, and so does RIFRA, is um, you know in the old days nobody ever won strict scrutiny um, cases, right? The government always lost if we got to compelling interest narrowly tailored. It seemed, and um, I think there's a, a there's a number of cases where. Um, plaintiffs are win winning strict scrutiny cases. Um, we had one in the 10th Circuit called 303 Creative where uh, my court ruled in favor of the state of Colorado um, by applying strict scrutiny to a, uh, an anti-discrimination act. Um, the Supreme Court's actually granted cert in that case for next fall, but it's one example of a successful um, uh, 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 success using strict, winning on strict scrutiny. So, so the question is, how uh, should courts de uh, uh, approach uh, a challenge based off of the freedom of assembly clause of the First Amendment? You know, uh, honestly, I've not dealt with that issue, I've, uh, and uh, so I'm not sure. Uh, but, you know, obviously it is uh, one of the five freedoms in the First Amendment, so it has to be respected. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I have to f uh, concede that I'm not sure how that would apply, uh, especially in the COVID context. Um, if you're interested, there's a professor at WashU St. Louis named John Inazu who's kind of written the book on this, and so you might look into his scholarship on you know how freedom of assembly is treated and how it should be treated, what the standards are, and whatnot. Thank you. I think this might primarily be for those who are but I'd love to hear what you have to say as well. Um, you've written in the Second Amendment context that protects history and traditions should be the guide. Um, it seems after Colton. Uh, so the question is uh, uh, that in, in the Second Amendment context, some judges such as myself has said that we have to, uh, we should apply a text history tradition test versus uh, tiers of scrutiny, which is the current um, standard. And the question is what do we, uh, would, would that sort of text history tradition test apply uh, to the free exercise clause if we, uh, in a post, I assume in a post uh, uh, Smith world, um, and which actually fascinating. We discussed this last night at dinner, <laughs> this very, very top, this very topic, and um, uh, and and the question, and, and so the answer could be, uh, and I think Judge Ho has a lot to say that we could just return to the pre-Smith era, which was applying a, a strict scrutiny uh, standard, um, uh, and that then we and we could work out any other issues 
after that. I do think there is some scholarship out there that shows, and I, and, and I remember, I think Judge McConnell, Michael McConnell from, from Stanford and a former 10th Circuit clerk wrote, wrote uh, 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 a treatise on how free exercise was, was done in the founding era and it was based off of a system of exemptions. So that would be something I would like to explore uh, if, if that case ever came to me. But, I, so, but bottom line is that I haven't fully thought that out. But that, uh, to me, uh, I have written that tiers of scrutiny are malleable and are, are a judicial construct that's atextual, ahistorical. And so maybe looking at some other type of test like you're talking about might be the way to go. But uh, I'm not there yet. So, am I on here? Uh, uh, you know, so in the COVID era, there's a lot of talk about religious exemptions with respect to vaccine mandates. Uh, believe it or not, I actually wrote a vaccine mandate religious exemption decision uh, before COVID. I think it was maybe like two or one or two months before COVID. A case called Horvath versus City of, City of Leander, and I talked about some of the qualified immunity issues that we've talked about today in terms of the clearly established doctrine. But I also talked about uh, Smith and sort of uh, discussed the criticisms of Smith, uh, which, uh, and d discussed the McConnell uh, piece uh, quite a bit, um, and uh, just sort of essentially noting that, that there's a lot of problems with what the Supreme Court did in Smith, and if the court's gonna revisit it at some point, uh, that would be very interesting and welcome. Uh, many, a number of justices, I think, I, I think we counted 10 justices to date have criticized uh, Employment <laughs> Division v. Smith. Um, you know, I realize that in Fulton there is this discussion about, well, if we get rid of Smith, what's to come next? Um, I, I'll, I'll confess, uh, I was a little surprised by that uh, comment because there, it would seem straightforward. You could either kind of go backwards in time or go forwards in time. Backwards in time would be take the law the day before Smith. Uh, Sherbert and Yoder and that whole line of cases, there's a pretty, uh, you know, obviously there's always tinkering to do in the law. That's why you have law schools and Supreme Court cases and, 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 and these debates going forward. Um, but so I'm not saying it's all fully fleshed out, but there was a robust, a more robust body of protection, uh, protectionist uh, ju jurisprudence the day before Smith. We could just return to that stream. Or you could fast forward, uh, as Judge uh, Timkovich just alluded to, to the 1993 enactment of RIFRA, uh, which, you know, after all, is the restoration of a Religious Freedom Act intended to essentially restore the law before Smith. Um, and, you know, whether you agree that RIFRA perfectly captured what the law was before Smith or not. It was certainly an attempt, or at least a stated attempt, to capture that law. So you could just as easily uh, just do the RIFRA standard uh, in explicit statutory text. You know, as to whether we want to sort of abandon this whole scrutiny concept and do something completely different, um, I'm, I'm open to it. Uh, I've, I've, I've written a Second Amendment opinion, Second Amendment opinion that sort of, uh, it's not nearly as uh, in-depth as what, what Judge Bumate has done, uh, but I've, uh, I've alluded to that debate as well. You know, if we want to have a systemic kind of overhaul of how we look uh, jurisprudentially at constitutional rights, I'm all for, you know, getting it right, getting it better, uh, making it more principled. I think to me the one thing is we should have a principled system of jurisprudence. It should not be, you know, we apply one standard to this constitutional right and a different standard to another constitutional right, either explicitly or implicitly because we like one right more than another, it should be systemic. So to my mind, the default would be whatever you do with one right, the default is you should do the same with other rights, unless there is some equally principled originalist, some sort of reason why actually this right should in fact be treated differently. So to me, it's just as long as we're systemic about it, I'm open to any discussion that, that makes us more accurate. Yeah, I, I endorse everything Judge Ho said about, about Smith, and I, you know, it's about time the Supreme Court took a case and told, told us what the new rule of the, of, of the road's gonna be. Um, I also, as a judge, I've, I've been frustra frustrated now for almost 20 years by the court's lemon jurisprudence. Yeah. And um, I think you know, anybody that's had to look at a case, decide a case, um, feels the same way that I do. Yeah. And I, there's probably more than 10 justices that have criticized <laughs> lemon, but yet they, they can't find four to get a cert grant yet. Um, and I, you know, I, there's been a couple of vehicles where that could happen, but I think that that's one area of jurisprudence where um, it's been demonstrably, uh, a demonstrable failure and that the court needs to really clarify going forward, you know, what, what a better um, analysis of entanglement is.
Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the clumsy immediate answer that comes to mind is social media is privately run. And so no state actor, no, no First Amendment, we're done. Um, with that being said, uh, Judge Silverman actually has a fascinating opinion, I want to say about a year ago, where he goes into this, uh, you know, with the understanding that the First Amendment is not just a constitutional command. As a constitutional command, of course, it's limited to government actors. But there's something deeper about the First Amendment that is, that is much broader, and that's sort of the tradition in our country of the free marketplace of ideas, respecting, you know, there used to be the saying that, you know, I, I detest what you say, uh, but I'll defend to, to my death uh, the right of you to say it. That has nothing to do with the government, that statement. That, that principle is one where we respect one another as fellow citizens, fellow human beings. We may disagree, we may disagree passionately, uh, but we get that we're enriched by making sure everybody has a chance to have their say and trusting in human reason, trusting each other that we may not end up convincing each other, but that we're all better off with the debate. You know, I'd like to think that, especially of all places at a law school, if there is some professor or some person that you just could not disagree with more, that's the person you most want to hear from, if nothing else, so that you can learn how to beat them. Right? You want to hear the best arguments made by the person who's most passionate about making those positions. Uh, you want to hear from them so that you can be a, a, a better at your craft. I presume each of you is here, at least in theory, to become a lawyer. And you're going to have to represent clients uh, and hopefully uh, prevail for your clients uh, in various forum. I guarantee you, the one thing you're going to want to know is what the other side's going to say, how they're going to argue, what, how they're going to respond to various questions. And to me, the best way to do that is to be constantly confronted by the opposition. And so, uh, you know, it's unfortunate, I guess I'll just say as a citizen, that this is uh, an ethos that seems to be uh, disappearing from society, um, including you know, all aspects. Social media is one important one, but it's really in, in various aspects. Um, it, it may not have anything to do, to do with the First Amendment directly, but there is an underlying uh, uh, American principle that I think is uh, sadly disappearing. Yeah, you know, there's a, a Second Circuit case from a couple years ago um, involving the President Trump's use of, twi of, uh, face of Twitter, I think, where he blo blocked a follower um, and the person, the plaintiff sued and, and actually won uh, uh, the argument in the, in the Second Circuit that the Twitter was a um, public forum and that the President could not block him. Uh, and we, we had a case in the Tenth Circuit involving a county commissioner who was, you know, pretty controversial, a bit of a bomb thrower. Um, he, he, he blocked some of the local constituents on Facebook, and, and it was a private Facebook account, um, something that existed before he became a candidate and then a winning uh, commissioner. And the district court in our, in our circuit in New Mexico found that there was kind of a, a First Amendment right to um, not, be, not be blocked by the county commissioner because he discussed public business from time to time on Facebook, and uh, the court, uh, court found that there was a constitutional violation. Um, now, this was a qualified immunity case, uh, and so when you get to the clearly established prong, um, you know, it's, it's not clearly, um, I was on the panel that, that uh, concluded that um, he had not shown that it was clearly established that you could not block somebody on Facebook or, or Twitter, and so we, we ruled against the um, plaintiff in that context. But you're gonna see, there's a lot of these cases bubbling around the country, um, and, uh, and you're gonna start to see you know, that, you know, that question being resolved um, in different ways. And um, I think the Supreme Court's, you know, the Supreme Court had granted cert in the Trump case, um, and then it found that after President Trump lost the election, it was moot, um, so it dis dismissed the, uh, the appeal. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so the question is, uh, it appears that, there, that there, the, uh, the practice of religion is, might be declining among the youth in the country and whether or not that will have impact, any impact on uh, First Amendment jurisprudence. Is, is that correct? So I, I have no statistical uh, or empirical evidence to either support or, or uh, deny what you're saying. Uh, I will say this, that uh, it shouldn't impact jurisprudence whatsoever. It doesn't matter how many people are, are religious in this country, whether or not the, the First Amendment is a fundamental right. It's, it, it is no matter if there's you know, one person practicing or uh, you know, 300 million people practicing religion. To me, it, should, it remains the same. No, and I certainly agree with that. Uh, I might use a Second Amendment analogy. Um, you know, if, if everybody owns a gun, uh, you might have a very different uh, cultural context in which the litigation takes place. Uh, it might affect the, the sort of the, the, the statistics might dictate the frequency of litigation, both the frequency of regulation and then, of course, the, the constitutional challenges to that regulation. So I can see the numbers affecting uh, the number of complaints and, fi and, and filings you'll see in court and as a result, the number of precedents. But, you know, if, if the law is principled, and I certainly hope it is, uh, the doctrines and the scope of protections and how judges treat it uh, should be completely orthogonal to the number of people who care about that right. Yeah, and the First Amendment was, um, you know, crafted in a, in a culture where um, rel people understood the um, um, discrimination against religious minorities. And so the declining, you know, religious sensibility makes the free exercise clause more important rather than less important. So we're just about out of time, so thank you all so much for coming. Um, we have another event coming up on April 26th. The First Amendment Center will host Nadine Strassen, former head of the ACLU, and Keith Whittington from Princeton University to discuss hate, speech, and the university. And will you please join me in thanking the judges for coming out today.